So today we're going to talk about story in the classroom. We're going to talk about African dance and dance in general. And we're going to talk about theater and how those all merge together and help us get out of a box and incorporate some creativity into the critical thinking and into writing um, and even science. So Confucius Proverbs says, tell me and I will forget. Show me and I will remember. Involve me and I will understand. So I'd like to start with a story. There was a woman that was dying to write a novel and she knew that she could write the best novel ever, but she had to find a secluded spot. So she searched and searched and searched. Finally, she found one, but there was a problem. She had to cross a river. She had no idea how she was going to do that. Then suddenly, a rowboat comes by. And she's like, oh, do you have room for me, please? And they say, well, sure, you can get aboard, but you're going to have to row. You're going to have to help us. So she gathers all of her papers and pens and typewriters and computer and plops in the rowboat, and she begins to row. And after not too long, her arms get weary. She becomes tired. Oh, how long are we going to have to row this boat? And suddenly, a huge windstorm stirs up. And along comes a sailboat. She yells at it, excuse me, excuse me, can you take me? I I'm trying to get across the river, and I need to get there quickly. And this is way too much work. Sure, they say. So she abandons the rowboat people, jumps into the sailboat, and is, oh, this is lovely. The wind is blowing in her hair. She doesn't have to do any work at all. And she's just kicking back her heels and very, very happy. I'll try. I should be there in no time. Well, that sudden windstorm dies down. And she finds herself bobbling in the river, still quite a ways from where she needs to get. Oh dear, now what are we going to do? Well, her luck changed once again when a motorboat came by and she just squealed with delight. Oh, please, can you take me? I've got to get across the river. Absolutely, come on in. Once again, she abandoned the sailboat people and jumped into the motorboat. And they're cruising along. She's excited. They're going at a really fast clip. I'll be there in no time. And about 20 minutes into the ride, putter, putter, putters but they've run out of fuel. Oh, dear. Well, now what are we going to do? Do you have any oars? We can get, we can, we can road, but there's not that, we can't be that far. Oh, we didn't think we would need them. We didn't realize we were going to run out of gas. So she says, well, let me see how far we are from the land. And she picks up the binoculars and she looks and there she's astonished for the little rowboat that she started in was ashore. So, what are some of the lessons in that story? Anybody? Darn it, you didn't want to be put on the spot. Damn. <laughs> okay, finish what you start with. How about there's no shortcuts in life, right? You have to, um, in yo I teach yoga, and in yoga we say, you know, it's, it, rather than taking a pill or, uh, you know, having some quick treatment, you have to do the practice. You have to go through the... the um. So stories teach us all sorts of things, right? They teach us... Um, it's the oldest form of learning. Before uh, there were words, before there was literature, not words, literature, there was the oral tradition, which in many cultures still exists. Um, the other thing that stories do, they connect us. Okay, um, they build community in the classroom. If you come into a classroom and you share a piece of yourself to the students, that lets them, first of all, know the kind of person you are. Second of all, it starts with a very informal and open atmosphere that students feel comfortable in. It creates sort of a safety in, in the um, classroom. One of the things I do first day of class is I have students get up, tell me their name, everyone their name, where, where they're at with their college um, degree, 
and what is the scariest thing that's ever happened to them. So we start right off the bat with story. And I've heard some incredible stories. And two, two reasons I do this. For all of us to feel comfortable with each other and maybe there's some camaraderie. A couple times there was people that had been in Afghanistan, some soldiers, oh, I was, I was over there. And, then, and so there's this camaraderie that happens. Also, it helps me remember their name because I'll say, oh, right. You're the one that jumped out of a plane when it was on fire. Oh, yeah. And so it, it, it helps me to do that. But it builds, stories build connection. And we want to create connection in our classrooms. So why? So that students are engaged, right? So that they're, they're um, not checked out, checking their phones, or um, thinking about what they're going to have for dinner. Um, the other thing that story does is it introduces cultures. And it gives students an uh, opportunity to look at things from a different perspective through story, through fiction. I like to use this book, Imagining America, Stories from the Promised Land, um, <clears throat> excuse me, edited by Wesley Brown and Amy Ling. It's a fabulous book. It's got all kinds of authors in here, very multicultural um, themed. And I like to have the students use this to critically think, to find parallels, and, um, and often they discover something about a culture that they didn't realize. You know? so, so that's another thing that's awesome. Um, and another book I like to use is the Ameri American Indian Myths and Legends. Um, this is a, a fabulous book as well um, for the same reason. It, it gives a different perspective, right? A different, a different, um, a different way of seeing things. Um, again, <clears throat> cultural aspect. Um, stories also help us deal with conflict. William um, Uri is um, a conflict resolution person. He's a writer. Uh, he's given uh, TED talks, and he tells one of his um, favorite uh, Middle Eastern stories about this son, I mean this father. He's got three sons and 17 camels. So he says, okay, oldest son, I'm going to give you half of my camels. Second son, I'm going to give you a third of my camels. And the third son, I'm going to give you a ninth of my camels. Okay, great. Thanks, Dad. That's awesome. Well, the three sons get talking. Uh, three can't be divided by 17, nine can't be divided by 17, two can't be divided, so nothing can be divided by 17. Well, how are we going to do this? We can't split the camel in half. And um, they get into a little bit of an, uh, an argument, okay, a conflict. So off they go to the wise old woman, and they explain to her what is going on. Can you help us? And she thinks for quite a while, and she says, you know, I'm... I don't think I can really help you, but I can give you one of my camels. Oh, fantastic. OK, well, now they've got 18 camels. So the first son gets half, so he gets nine. Second son get, is, gets a third, so he gets six, to do my math. <laughs> and the last one, a, thir um, a, a ninth, gets two camels. That adds up to 17. Oh, we've got an extra camel. So they give the camel back to the old woman. OK, so the story allows us to look at topics with fresh eyes, with a different perspective that we may not have thought of. Um, stimulates the creativity, stimulates the, uh, the critical thinking in a different kind of way. Um, another uh, thing about story that is incredible is we get the lost stories. So, and this is really fantastic because when you start digging around for those lost stories, you also make this really interdisciplinary. We're not just, this isn't just a composition class. We're not just going to talk about format, periods, semicolons, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to dive into some history. We're going to dive into some women's rights. I wrote a play with my daughter called The Great Forgotten, and it's being looked at by Broadway producers. This isn't a plug for, for that. But 
The point being, we did tons and tons of research on World War I nurses, which, by the way, there's very little. Um, and all that they went through. They were serving in the army, yet never got any rank. They didn't, they weren't even recognized. I think it was in 1973 that they finally got uh, recognized for all of their efforts. But the stories, where they, where they got most of the information was from diaries that the women kept, journals that they kept. And from there, they were able to glean uh, some of this factual information. And um, so those, those lost stories, or even those stories historically that we've heard over and over and over that aren't true, okay? Those stories that aren't true any longer. Um, for instance, uh, well, I was just thinking about, there's a new film out about Vietnam. Um, Burns is the guy's name. It's called The Vietnam War. Um, and it's a, new ser it's a new series on PBS, and it's fabulous. And I started watching it, and I was absolutely flabbergasted for my own ignorance of not really realizing the whole history behind um, Ho Chi Minh and the whole history of the French involvement in that war. I had no idea. But through these stories now, I'm being unearthing these lost stories, unearthing history. Um, and these are great tools that you can have your students, say, you can say to them, find out about uh, what you can find out about, about African American nurses, why they weren't allowed to, in World War I, go and, uh, and, and do their duty, although they had the exact same training. Go into your family history, dig around, ask questions. I, this is an assignment I give them. Ask questions. And then, I, and then find out what was the, what historical relevance politically, what was going on during your grandparents' era, during um, anybody that, that's a little bit older in, in your family that you can get, that they're willing to talk to you and get some information, and then do some research. Um, in my own family, my grandmother on my father's side um, <clears throat> uh, became an orphan at 13. So, uh, as she grew up, she got married, became pregnant with my father, and at seven months pregnant, he died of tuberculosis. So here she was, pregnant, you know, no support. There was no support for women um, back then, particularly, you know, single mothers. Uh, there wasn't such a thing. And she had no real family because she had been raised in an orphanage. So she decided to put him back in the orphanage at eight months and go train to be a nurse. And at that time, if you were training to be a nurse, you had one day, half a day off, really. You had to go to church. And, and you <clears throat> had that one day off um, in between learning, scrubbing bedpans, toilets, cleaning sheets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, long story short, this highly affected and impacted my father's emotional life, which then impacted my life and my sister's and brother's lives. Um, until the stories came out. There was so much pain and agony and walking around that gigantic elephant that my father closed up a lot and he wouldn't talk about things. Um, he was a great storyteller, though. <laughs> Is, I should say. He's still alive. Um, and so once those stories began unraveling and the questions, and it basically was me. When I got old enough, I started asking questions. Well, what, what about this? Well, why this? He just thought that she, he aban she abandoned him because he was unworthy. He wasn't lovable. And so when this all came to be and, and he discovered that, no, she didn't have a choice. She didn't have a choice, like many people today don't have a choice. So where's the parallels? I don't have a choice. i got to leave my country, or I will not survive. My children will not survive. So drawing from uh, stories within your own families um, is very powerful stuff and engages, um, engages students a lot. And they, they usually are quite surprised at things that they didn't know um, about their grandparents or someone that was in war, et cetera. Um, uh, <clears throat> again, this, this slide is just, you know, the, this is a slide from the memorial in Washington, D.C. 
about um, the nurses in Vietnam and their experience, um, and again, their story. Um, one of the things I like to do, uh, one story in here in particular that I use every semester just about is a story by Nash Candelaria, and it's called El Patron, and it's got a lot of varying themes in it, generational themes, war, um, that are completely relevant in today's world. Um, another thing that's very relevant in today's world is poetry. And um, in 2002, the New York Times uh, put out a, an article about Rumi. The, um, the poet Rumi, and he was the most read in the United States in 2002. Now that's amazing. You know, this was a, I believe, 13th century, correct me if I'm wrong, a poet that is still read today. So again, you see the relevance of literature, you see the relevance of um, poetry, of story, and, and bringing it into the classroom regardless of the, um, of the topic. You can, you can bring story into math. You can bring story into science. It, it might make it a little more you know, engaging in some ways for students. Um, so there's another aspect of story I want to talk about, but I'm going to wait a little bit to the end of the, um, to the, end of the, uh, of the discussion here. Um, I'm going to move on to African dance. How in the heck does African dance have anything to do with what we do in the classroom? I came into African dance in 1991. I was at Sonoma State and heard drumming, came into the classroom. Wow. And I was absolutely taken away with this style of dance. The wonderful thing about African dance um, is it's very communal and it's very forgiving. Zimbabwe proverb says, if you can talk, you can sing. If you can walk, you can dance. So it's very forgiving, it's very, um, it's very communal, and it is also a way to get out of your mind and get into your body. Um, Kenneth Robinson, uh, Sir, excuse me, Sir Kenneth Robinson, uh, gave a wonderful TED talk about our schools killing creativity, and it's absolutely hilarious. I advise you guys to look at this in, in, on a TED talk. But he talks about how we begin. You know, when you're in kindergarten, you might be moving a little bit, you might be doing a little bit of something, and then we begin to educate from the neck up. And he talks. He tells this hilarious thing about. Um, professors and how they are just completely disconnected and I said excuse me not all of us completely disconnected from their bodies the head their bodies is just a way to carry the head around to meetings I love that <laughs> I was like oh all right um, but he tells this wonderful story about this little girl in England it was 1930s and she was fidgety what she probably is what we would call ADD today and you know couldn't focus etc so the school calls her mother and says you're gonna have to take her to the doctors there's something wrong here she's distracting the other kids we can't have this this is the 1930s can't have this okay mother takes the little girl to the doctors they are in this room and the little girl's sitting on her hands the whole time the doctor's asking her questions and you know she's answering them and at the end of the of the um, conversation he says well now honey I have to go talk to your mom in the other room so um, we'll be right back and before he leaves the room he turns on the radio and they go out and observe the little girl she doesn't know they're looking at her and she begins to move and to dance and the doctor turns to the woman and she says he says excuse me there's nothing wrong with your daughter. She's a dancer. Take her to a dance class. And so the mother took that advice, and um, this person went on, her name is uh, Gillian Lynn, 
and she went on to choreograph some of the most amazing Broadway shows. Um, she danced for the uh, Royal um, Ballet Academy in London, um, has been on television, just done tremendously creative things. She choreographed um, Cats, um, Phantom of the Opera, all kinds of things. So imagine, imagine if we didn't have uh, those things in today's world. So opening up and stimulating the creative mind rather than medicating or uh, putting, well, dance goes in this box, theater goes in this box, writing goes in this box. Why not merge them all together so that we begin to be fully alive and human again? So we begin to not think that we have to uh, define ourselves, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm just, I'm a teacher, that's it. I'm a, a secretary, I'm whatever. We are all of these things. And when we learn to teach differently, we've been teaching the same way for quite a while, and I know technology has changed this quite a bit, but we still have a ways to go to connect that thread to creativity um, and critical thinking and, and teaching and, and how we teach um, in the classroom. Um, think about your own self. When you're having a conflict or an issue or you're, you've got to write a paper, you know, one thing, what, one of the best things you can do is to go for a walk, to move your body, get out of your head, get out of the thinking mind and get into the body because we hold things in our bodies. And by moving, we loosen up that circulation, literally. I mean, you literally are getting moving. So rather than just sitting and being stuck, looking at a blank sheet of paper, and I, oh, I have no idea what I want to write about. Take out your headphones. Don't listen to your headphones. Literally go for a walk and observe. Observe what's around you. Listen to conversation. Um, eavesdrop. You know, there's all kinds of ways that, that we can stimulate our, um, our creativity. OK, back to the African dance. Everybody, since this is a very small group, you're going to join me on the, on the stage or down here. We're going to, just, we're going to do a little, a little dancing. Just a little. I know you're eating. It's fine. Just a little teeny tiny bit. Um, it's a it's, it's, it's very short part of a um, welcome dance. OK, so this is a, I'm going to put, I had live drummers coming. They bailed on me, guys. OK. Okay, so what we're going to do, give me a little room here, okay. We're just going to do this. Everything in African dance is very earth-centric. So just really, so no ballet stuff, just really hard like an elephant. And we're going to go up, 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 down, and down to the earth. Earth, earth, earth. And again, take it up. Praising Father's Son. Take it down to the earth. Yeah, there we go. OK, one more time, one more time. Up, up, up. Yeah, then you got it. Down, thanking Mother Earth. And now it's huh? Ah, uh, so you just step, 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 step. Maybe if you went up there, you had more yeah. room. <laughs> step. <laughs> there we go. Step. Step, two more. Step, step, yeah, you got it. All right. Nice. Okay, now that's one more, one more we're gonna learn. Looks like this, you go. Step it back with your right foot. You got it. Nice, all right, here we go. Four, three, two, nice. One, from the top, we go up, 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 up. Take it down, 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 down. And we go to the right, and we go left. One more time, right, you got it, left, right. And we go, nice, woo! Nice, okay, I think you guys are ready for this. So after da da, da 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 da, da da, four times, and you go one, two, three, four. Calling everybody, calling everybody, 
into the circle, okay? So let's start with this. Ba ba. Da 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 da. Ba da ba 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 ba. One more, here we go. And we take it around. Bop, 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 bop. Beautiful. Now we, we end with this. We thank each other for showing up. We give, we give thanks. We give thanks. We give thanks. We give thanks. Awesome. Now see, don't you feel like your energy is moving? Oh, yeah. And like, I feel like I know you guys now. So everybody give yourselves a big hand on that one. Okay, uh, let's see. Moving right along. Okay, so we talked about dance. I think it was in Ireland. They teach a lot of dance in um, elementary, junior high, and they're bringing it to high school and then beyond um, to teach math. You know, one, two, one, two, three, and one. So there's lots of things you can do to, um, to incorporate music. Three-fourths time, four-fourths time, two-fourths time. It's a fraction, you know? So there's, it's, you can use so many different ways to, um, to learn things. Okay, so how does theater, how does theater play into all of this? Uh, dramatize the lesson. Dramatize the lesson, right, right. Um, what I tend to do in my classes is I will have an improv. Improvisation really encourages those uh, critical thinking skills, uh, creativity, collaboration, uh, commu communication. So those four big C's, it really uh, make, it teaches students to think quickly, to trust themselves. Because it's yes and, you know, then you just move on. So we might take a topic, we might take something that's relevant, we might take um, a story that we've read and, and start some improv. Now, I realize that there are students that are absolutely, completely shy, and that's, I don't ever make anyone. I encourage, and typically about halfway through the semester, because I have a lot of interactive um, work in, in the classroom, they've gotten comfortable with each other and feel safe with each other, so they're willing to get up and, and, and um, do that. Um, another thing, children's theater. Children's theater, you can have um, students take a part of history or take a persuasive essay or um, something they've written about and create a, a, a play. They don't have to be dramaturgs. They don't have to be playwrights. They don't have to be even studied theater or even seen theater. Well, hopefully they've seen it. Maybe not. <laughs> um, to create, to, you find who are the important characters in this story? Who, who do we need in the story? You know, what, what, is, what is the arc in the story? What's the tension? What's the conflict? How do we resolve it? So it teaches them, you know that when you have to teach something, you have to really know it. At least you hope you do. <laughs> You're always finding things you don't know. Um, so that's one thing I love to do with my students, is to have them create a play. If you were gonna, if you were gonna perform this for children, and they have to get the gist of it, who are the main characters? What is the, what is the conflict? How do they resolve it? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, Deanna Kreiss of Improv Boston's national touring company, um, she wrote, improv enthusiasts rave about its educational value. Not only does it hone communication and public speaking skills, it also stimulates Fast thinking and engagement with ideas on a deeper level, improv chips away at mental barriers that block creative thinking. I love that. <clears throat> that internal editor who crosses out every word before it's even on the page and rewards spontaneity, intuitive response. Christ says, because improv depends on the group providing categorical support for every answer, participants also grow in confidence and feel more you know, secure with, with, with speaking out. Um, and this, again, this can be done you know, in so many ways. Um, it keeps your, your thinking sharp, um, you know, how to, how to think on a dime, and that really just bleeds into every other thing that you do in your life. Uh, and again, builds communication skills. And we all need communication skills. 
Um, finally, there's some African dance in Africa. Um, I've had the great pleasure of studying from masters. I have not been to Africa myself yet, yet, I say. Um, but I've studied um, from people from uh, Ghana, from West Africa, from the Congo, from um, Zimbabwe. Uh, and each style is a little bit different, but it's all very, very inclusive, as I said. Whoops. So freedom from the old stories, going kind of coming back full circle to the stories. As educators, as students, we all have tapes in our head, right? We all have those tapes that say, oh, I, you know, I'm just not good at math, and I, I'm not, no, I, uh, I can't write. Um, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Those stories don't serve you anymore. Those are old stories. They belong to somebody else. They need to be shredded. They need to be dissolved. So rewriting new stories. And teachers have stories as well, and we need to be in tune with our stories. We need to, to realize our biases and how our biases impact our teaching, because it does. Absolutely. So we have to be willing to know what is, what is our story? What is my story? What do I want my story to be? What is the legacy I want to leave behind? And if we're not honest with ourselves, then we may have a student that they just bug us. We don't know why, but they just bug us. And we are, are not giving that full opportunity, that fertile soil for that student to grow. We might be harder on that student inadvertently, unconsciously. Um, so I think we always need to be up on top of that. We need to know what stories do we need to let go of. What stories that, that um, and encourage students to, I encourage my students to do that. When I hear students say, oh, I can't do that. Mm. Mm, yeah, you can. You may not want to do it. That's different. <laughs> saying I don't want to do something and saying I can't do it, right? Completely different things. So, um, so story can also bring us some freedom uh, and recreating the new stories uh, can be extremely liberating for both students and for teachers. So, um, in conclusion, I hope that you've gotten some ideas on how to incorporate dance, music, theater, literature, stories, multiculturalism, all into whatever you are teaching. For, uh, if you're teaching a chemistry class, maybe there's a story about um, a scientist from a different country uh, uh, that the students didn't know about. Inject it into the lesson. Why not? It doesn't have to just be the one-sided. You want, us to, want me to read your story? OK. I have one. So I was like, I don't know if they're sick of sitting and listening to me. Because you know, a lot of these talks, they have more than one person. So I got to put these on. This just started. And it's so annoying. OK. So this is a story from um, Indian, American Indian Myths and Legends, selected and edited by Richard Erdos and Alfonso Ortez, Ortiz. How the Sioux came to be. This story was told to me by a Santi grandmother a long time ago, a really long time, when the world was still freshly made. Onkita, the water monster, fought the people and caused a great flood. Perhaps the great spirit, Wanka Tonka, was angry with us for some reason. Maybe he let Onkita win out because he wanted to make a better kind of human being. Well, the waters got higher and higher. Finally, everything was flooded except the hill next to the place where the sacred red pipeline quarry lies today. The people climbed up there to save themselves, but it was no use. The water swept over the hills. Waves tumbled, the rocks and pinnacles smashing them down on the people. Everyone was killed, and all the blood gelled making one big pool. The blood turned to pipestone and created the pipestone quarry, the grave of those ancient ones. That's why the pipe made of that red rock is so sacred to us. Its red bowl is the flesh and blood of our ancestors. Its 
it stems in the backbone of these people, long dead, and smoke rising from it is their breath. I tell you, that pipe, that shanompa, comes alive when used in a ceremony. You can feel power flowing from it. Untkita, the big water monster, was also turned to stone. Maybe Tonkanshila, the grandfather spirit, punished her for making the flood. Her bones are in the badlands now. Her back forms a long, high ridge, and you can see her vertebra sticking out in a great row of red and yellow rocks. I have seen them. It scared me when I was on the ridge. She was moving beneath me, breathing, wanting to topple me. Well, when all the people were killed so many generations ago, one girl survived, a beautiful girl. It happened this way. When the water swept over the hill where they tried to seek refuge, a big spotted eagle, Wambli Galashka, swept down and grabbed her, hold, uh, took, told her to take hold of his feet. As she was hanging on, he flew to the top of the tall tree which stood on the highest stone pinnacle in the Black Hills. That was the eagle's home. It became the only spot not covered with water. If the people had gotten up there, they would have survived. But it was a needle-like rock, as smooth and steep as the skyscrapers you now have in the big cities. My grandfather told me that maybe the rock was not in the Black Hills. Maybe it was Devil's Tower, as white men call it. That place in Wyoming, both places are sacred. Wombly kept that beautiful girl with him and made her his wife. There, there was a close connection then between people and animal, so he could do it. The eagle's wife became pregnant and bore him twins, a boy and a girl. She was happy and said, now we will have people again. Oh, it is good. The children were born right there on top of that cliff. When the waters finally subsided, Wombly helped the children and their mother down from his rock and put them on the earth, telling them, be a nation, become a great nation, the Lakota. The boy and grew, girl grew up. He was the only man on earth, and she was the only woman of childbearing age. They married, they had children, and a nation was born. So we are descended from the eagle. We are an eagle nation. That is good, something to be proud of because the eagle is the wisest of birds. He is the great spirit's messenger. He is a great warrior. That is why we always wore the eagle plume and still wear it. We are a great nation. It is I, lame deer, who said this. So. And you know, that, what a great story that is for students to read. They have to go back and dig around and find out where the Badlands are, what's happened, and, and all the desecration that happened with the Native people. So story and dance and theater is very much integral to our learning. Thank you. Mm -hmm.